Welcome UK families. We are very excited to be bringing you a special edition of Cat Chat Live this evening. As you can see, we are not on Zoom. We are coming to you live on Facebook and YouTube from the Senate Chambers in the Gatton Student Center. My name is Nikki Jenkins. I'm the Senior Program Specialist for the Parent and Family Association, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, a video recording of this presentation will be available later this evening um, on the Cat Chat Live website as well as on YouTube. We will also be emailing a link of the video to the Parent and Family Association membership. So if you have not joined the Parent and Family Association, now's the time to do it. And you can do that online at www.uky.edu slash join UKPFA. I want to start tonight um, by introducing some of our esteemed panelists who are here to talk to us um, about some of the things that are going on on campus with, the, uh, with Campus Restart. We know that a lot of families have had some questions and so hopefully tonight we will be able to answer some of those questions. So throughout the presentation, feel free to drop those questions into the comment section, either on Facebook or YouTube. And we have um, some folks behind the scenes who will be able to answer those questions and hopefully we'll get to answer some of those um, live with our panelists as well this evening. So first up this evening, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kirsten Turner, who is the Associate Provost for Academic and Student Affairs. And she's going to be speaking to us tonight uh, a little bit about um, student success efforts this fall. Um, followed closely by Dr. Robert DePaula, Dean of UK's College of Medicine, who will be talking to us about UK's START plan. Nick Kerwell, Dean of Students, um, has information for us about the UK Health Corps and student testing. Trisha Clement Montgomery is the Director of Residence Life and is here to address questions regarding living on campus and some of the, some of the things that families have been um, asking specifically um, to, um, to some of the housing um, things that are going on. And then Trey Conister, um, Associate Director for um, the Center, of, Center for Enhancement of Learning and Teaching, we call it SALT, um, will be speaking to faculty preparations for the use of in-person and online modalities. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Turner. Thank you, Nikki. And I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you and, and really looking forward to the discussion. Um, as uh, Nikki mentioned, uh, I'm the uh, Chief Student Affairs Officer for the institution, and so ensuring the well-being of our students is, is the most important thing that, that I do and think about and that we all do collectively. I'm also a parent myself, um, and so I understand how important this conversation is as we think about sending our loved ones um, back to school and what that means and making sure it's in a safe environment. Um, We've, uh, when we think about student success, uh, we obviously we think about the, the formal curriculum in the classroom, but we also think about all the co-curricular and extracurricular activities and that a lot of those experiences can, can really transform in a student's life and their, their undergraduate and, and graduate experiences. And so how can you do that in, in an environment where social distancing and mask wearing and, and, and even virtually take place? And so we've been spending a lot of time um, in, in our unit thinking about ways in which we engage students, um, whether it is in person but in socially distant um, environments. Um, where we were across campus, we've started to transform outdoor spaces, um, putting up tents, putting up uh, um, uh, different types of um, gathering spaces that have appropriate distancing, but where students could maybe interact in, in terms of programming or in terms of um, uh, uh, ways in which to, to, to experience kind of the co-curricular or extracurricular activities. We've also, um, in, in addition to those types of um, um, uh, avenues of, of participation, thinking about students' uh, well-being around um, uh, both physical well-being, psychological well-being, and, and emotional well-being. So we are starting to open our campus rec centers, but, but absolutely in socially distanced um, uh, 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 geography in terms of the, the, the types of machines that we have. Um, in terms of uh, the types of uh, group fitness classes that we have, if they're socially distanced and appropriate. We've also, um, in terms of our counseling center, our career center, our academic advising, offering those in dual modalities, so both in, in terms of um, uh, providing virtual uh, counseling sessions or advising sessions, if that's the student's choice, or if the student needs or would like to meet with someone in person, 
having that in an environment that is, is appropriate and socially um, um, distant or, or plexiglass uh, uh, laden so that, so that people are safe and can return. Those are just kind of some, some small examples and some, some small ways in which we've been thinking almost every single service that we provide, almost every single experience that the student has, how we can do this in a way that mitigates risk, that keeps our, our staff and our faculty as well as our students safe, um, that allows them to make the decision on whether or not they want to do it in person or whether, the, or whether it's, it's uh, um, better for them for all sorts of reasons to do it virtually and, and providing those options to our students around um, every, every service we provide, even things like tutoring and, um, and academic uh, uh, enhancement around you know, the writing center or, or things of that nature. Just wanted to give kind of a brief introduction on, on kind of the student support services. Um, and now I'll turn it over to, to Dean Bob DePaula, who, who's going to talk about our, our start plan and from, from the medical perspective. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, welcome, uh, all of you. Uh, and I you know, just want to maybe fill you in a bit on uh, some of the process and, and the team that was. Welcome, all of you. Um, thank you, Dr. Turner, and thank you, Nikki. Um, I, I wanted to just welcome you all and maybe fill you in a bit on the process uh, that was set up to be sure uh, that we had uh, the best of experts meeting regularly to look at the evidence and make sure that we were um, creating and, and formulating and recommending a plan uh, with the highest priority uh, for your uh, student safety and health um, and really creating a safe and healthy uh, public health uh, community here uh, on the campus. Um, just to, to fill you in a little bit, you know, as, you, as you're seeing in the, in the press on a regular basis, there's a lot of evidence and a lot of information on testing and on screening and on social distancing and using masks. Um, when you really look at that, the evidence uh, for how to deal best uh, with this virus, with the coronavirus, uh, has emerged very rapidly over the past few months. Um, you know, um, in terms of a group of experts, um, we have, and I'm just going to go through the membership just briefly so you get a sense of the expertise. And I can tell you that this team, we've called it the START team. Um, the START team actually stands for Screening, Testing, and Tracing uh, to Accelerate, Restart, and Transition. Um, the group of experts range from physicians, I'm a physician myself, and researchers, uh, to experts in virology, meaning understanding the biology of the virus itself, to epidemiology, to understanding how it, um, how it affects the community and how to prevent it. Um, the, the team members include Dr. Donna Arnett, who's the Dean of the College of Public Health, who's an epidemiologist, Dr. Suzanne Arnold, who's an Associate Director at our Cancer Center uh, and an expert on clinical trials and understanding those, the, the research, uh, Dr. Becky Dutch, uh, who's the chair of the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry, who's an expert, uh, internationally known virologist, so meaning she studies viruses like coronavirus. Um, Dr. Derek Forrester, uh, who's the medical director in infection prevention and control. He is an infectious disease physician. Dr. Daryl Jennings, uh, he is the chair of our Department of Pathology at the College of Medicine uh, and runs the whole testing center for UK healthcare, so he understands uh, testing and the, and the metrics and technology behind testing uh, for this virus. Dr. Jill Kalesser from the, the College of Pharmacy. Dr. Uh, Ian, Dr. Ian McClure, or Ian McClure, the Executive Director of the Office of Technology and Commercialization. Brian Nichols, Chief Informatics Officer, Information Officer. Um, Captain Evan Ramsey, uh, who's a, a liaison for us to the larger uh, organization within the structure of the campus to make sure that information that's coming from the START team uh, is sorted through and best applied to the campus uh, to create a safe environment. Um, Dr. Frank uh, Romanelli, who's also in the College of Pharmacy, uh, Jennifer Rose and Colleen Schwartz from uh, UK Healthcare, uh, where uh, much of what's being done across the campus, including um, assessment or screening and testing, uh, has been done and piloted in our health system. One of the, one of the benefits of having uh, a large uh, medical center within our university structure uh, is, uh, is, the, is leveraging the expertise and understanding from that health system. Dr. Heidi Weiss, who's an expert on statistics or biostatistics to understand the data, uh, and Richard Chapman from, from our compliance area. This group meets regularly. Um, we're communicating uh, every day, sometimes multiple times a day, 
Um, the areas that we've assessed early on, with, at least with the initial recommendations of the plan, including testing, screening, screening for symptoms and so forth, um, PPE or protective equipment, personal protective equipment, how to social distance properly, um, and how to uh, what we call quarantine, or at least um, uh, protect any of those individuals that are positive for COVID-19, uh, as well as decrease any risk of transmission uh, to others. Um, when you look at the plan, uh, and you can see it obviously on the website, you can pull down the whole, the whole plan for the playbook that this is, and obviously this is a component of it. Um, you can see in there that there are multiple layers of safety. Um, the virus itself, um, you know, is transmitted uh, in a number of ways, but, the, but the, the biggest way that we've learned over the past few months is by aerosolization. And that's why recommendations for masking has become very appropriate and very important uh, and critical, uh, as well as social distancing. Um, and what you heard from Dr. Turner and you'll hear from others uh, is that we've looked at every different means uh, to increase safety uh, by maximizing um, those layers in terms of masking, PPE, uh, and social distancing and having to structure uh, the campus uh, accordingly. Um, the, only other, the only other comments I wanted to make is, is that when you look at um, what's emerging over time, you will see and continue to see different reports, new evidence on a regular basis, new papers that come out in terms of studies. And I can tell you as a team of experts, we are analyzing every one of those that come out that might have relevance uh, where we have an opportunity to modify or increase uh, some of the efforts that we're, we're actually undertaking um, to promote safety uh, and health across the, across the campus. Uh, in fact, we've, we've met now a number of times even today and yesterday uh, over some of the things that you're seeing in the press uh, that come out from new studies to be sure that um, we are uh, taking uh, and leveraging anything that's out there that might be helpful along the way. Um, as you know, and I'll, and I'll just uh, end with this because you'll hear more about testing. Um, uh, testing has begun. Uh, with, a, with a plan to test all of the students uh, and monitor that with uh, contact tracing, some of the components I mentioned before uh, that were uh, at least recommended by the initial START team recommendations. But just so you know that we continue to meet and we continue to monitor the evidence uh, as, it's, uh, as it's emerging out there and apply it as best possible. So thank you. Dean Kerlald. Yes, good evening. Uh, yeah, before I sort of uh, talk a little bit more about student testing in particular and, and uh, the, the UK Health Corps and uh, how, how we're, you know, trying to have a, a, a safe fall, uh, I guess I really just want to start with our sort of principal uh, value, if you will, which is uh, always trying to think about and put the safety of our students uh, in, our, in our entire UK community first. Uh, and I think President Capilouto has also uh, really emphasized, and, and we spend a great deal thinking about how do we make this easy for our students and for our campus. And so uh, as we think about a lot of the healthy behaviors that Dean DiPaolo uh, just referenced, uh, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, how do we make it easy uh, to do this? Uh, because ultimately, uh, compliance with, with these measures and, and compliance with what we're asking students to do, if it's not easy, uh, right, it, it makes that compliance harder. So uh, as was referenced, we started uh, student testing on Monday uh, on the 3rd. Uh, and that initial student testing will go all the way through the 22nd. Uh, I think our initial three days uh, have gone really, really well. Uh, we've had uh, great turnout by our students uh, in terms of making appointments and registering for that testing. Uh, and and uh, I think in working with uh, our colleagues across campus, uh, I think they will tell you that the average time to go through that process and get tested, whether it's uh, our drive-through testing at Kroger Field uh, or one of our walk-up, uh, one of our four walk-up locations, uh, the, the, the average time to get tested is about five minutes. Um, and so for our off-campus students, that also includes uh, receiving their wellness kit. And so our wellness kits, which has uh, two of these masks that I'm wearing uh, currently with a thermometer, hand sanitizer, and um, uh, also just some information about uh, resources on campus. Um, uh, so students can do basically both get tested and, and receive that at the same time. Um, I think we've seen great uh, feedback about how that's going. Uh, I would just like to sort of say that we will encourage all students 
um, to one, uh, you know, you can get tested before you arrive, uh, right, within seven days of your arrival. Um, you, you can submit that uh, result through our UK um, health portal, um, and, and we will res, uh, review that. Uh, we're asking all students to do the, the PCR uh, nasal swab test. Um, that's really, really important. And again, I, that, that came out of our start group in terms of really looking at the evidence and thinking about the type of test that we wanted uh, for our students. Um, the other thing I would mention, uh, just as it relates to testing for, for anyone who's coming to, to Lexington in the UK campus, we really, really encourage students to get tested as soon as possible. Uh, really just think about how important that is uh, in, in terms of the Commonwealth of Kentucky and our governor uh, and, and thinking and looking across the country. Uh, and we have uh, many students that, that come to uh, University of Kentucky from across, not just the, the United States, but across uh, the globe. Um, obviously, I think everyone's you know, really concerned about some of the positivity rates that they're seeing in other states. Um, and, and so one of our recommendations is to get tested uh, as soon as possible, as soon as you arrive on campus. Uh, and, and also uh, in the spirit of that uh, travel advisory from, from Governor Bashir in, in Kentucky uh, is to self-quarantine until you get those results. Uh, just uh, again, uh, just as a measure to be really mindful, not, not just about your own personal health, uh, but thinking about the health of others that are coming onto this campus. Um, Again, uh, as a student, you should have received multiple uh, text messages and emails. Uh, we also have a link uh, within our FAQ uh, that you can find uh, on our website. Um, and so again, uh, any student that has any problems as well in terms of you know, complications with that registration process, um, the best way uh, to sort of uh, troubleshoot that uh, is to just send an email to healthcore at uky.edu. Uh, we have people who are monitoring that, uh, working uh, directly with our vendor, Wild Health, um, to, to address any of those uh, sort of uh, issues that, that students may be facing through that process. Um, but overall, uh, again, our first three days have been really, really successful. Uh, obviously, it's really important for us as we think about, again, uh, we have students from uh, every county in the Commonwealth, all 50 states, and, and, and again, uh, you know, several countries uh, in the world. Um, one of the things I also really wanted to talk about is uh, as we think about the health core and as uh, Dean DePaula talked about, uh, we are going to be asking all students to do a daily screening. Uh, there's going to be some broad communication that goes out uh, next Monday on August 10th. Uh, and that screening is really, really important uh, of trying to get students to, to just sort of reflect on and think about any symptoms that they may be having. Uh, and so our daily screener has been reviewed by the START Committee. Uh, it aligns uh, with, with some recommendations out of the CDC. Uh, and again, uh, the screening is really, really helpful because if you are symptomatic, um, we want you to get tested. Um, and, and obviously, if, if that result is positive, we really, really want to mitigate, um, you, you know, as a student, um, having contact with others. And so really thinking about stopping the spread of this. And so that screening really helping in terms of uh, getting students into testing. Uh, and then again, doing that follow up in terms of our contact tracing and our care and follow up with our students. And so the UK Health Corps, um, as we think about a lot of these functions, um, uh, we're really uh, leveraging technology to assist us in this process. And so we have the capacity where, like I said, we will be sending daily communications to students, asking them to screen, um, reviewing uh, students' compliance with that daily screening, sending follow-up reminders, uh, calls reminding students to do that screening. Uh, and again, it really is to help uh, have people reflect on their health behaviors uh, and, and ultimately get them to testing if they need it. The only, uh, I, I know we, there's been a lot of questions about what this process looks like in terms of, you know, what happens if, you know, my son or daughter is uh, is positive for coronavirus. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, what that process will look like. Uh, in, in our UK Health Corps, uh, we have hired uh, a group of individuals that are really doing uh, the case management and contact tracing for the institution. And, and, and part of the reason that we've done that, uh, again, is really from this approach of care. 
Uh, and, and part of this too is, is to really try to design in some ways in, in uh, a closed loop operational system. And so uh, it, through the use of technology, uh, our capacity to screen, to get students testing immediately, um, we've really evaluated our testing capacity uh, the, the current partnership that we have with Wild Health that's doing our initial student testing, we can get those lab results uh, in 24 or no later than 48 hours. Uh, and that time is really important in terms of our capacity then to follow up. Um, our group of case managers and contact tracers will be making calls to students if they are uh, positive for coronavirus um, and really walking them through that process. A again, part of the reason we're doing this uh, it, it's for really two reasons. One, uh, we believe in sort of high touch uh, and providing that level of care and trying to utilize all of the great resources that we have at the institution. Um, in terms of uh, that isolation process, one of the common questions that we've been seeing is, you know, can my son or daughter go home? And, and ultimately the answer to that is yes. Um, I think it's just also really important for, for parents and families to understand that uh, there are some things that come along with that. And so thinking about, uh, you know, when your son or daughter might, you know, might have uh, coronavirus, uh, what that means for you all, uh, and, and, you know, trying to effectively uh, create an environment uh, where your son or daughter can isolate. Uh, and, and again, for, for not just your own protection, um, and, and, but also, uh, of course, we want to design it for the protection of other students on our campus. Um, we have also designed uh, facilities on campus for our on-campus students uh, to isolate. And, and so that would mean, uh, you know, moving in them into those locations uh, again so we can really stop uh, uh, the spread of COVID. Uh, some really other major pieces uh, that I think both uh, Dr. Turner and, and uh, Dean DePaula have really uh, touched on in terms of the UK Health Corps uh, and thinking about what we're doing. Uh, again, really thinking about how we redesign our outdoor space on campus, thinking about how we, we have more outdoor seating, out, uh, more outdoor spaces that are physically distanced. Uh, again, thinking about um, how to do that because uh, of, of being an aerosol, uh, and the importance of being outdoors in terms of how that helps us. Um, we will have wellness hubs on campus. Again, that's really to promote healthy behaviors uh, throughout the semester. We will have groups of students and uh, student ambassadors um, uh, that will help uh, students in terms of education, but also help with compliance. Um, and again, uh, really partnered uh, with several folks on campus uh, and really trying to emphasize uh, healthy behaviors for this fall. So uh, I've already talked about, you know, completing a daily screening. Obviously, physically distancing is really, really important uh, and, and wearing a mask or a face covering. Uh, and, and again, all of that uh, is really in partnership in, in terms of the uh, you know, the research and the expertise uh, that was really done by that start committee and, and uh, several other individuals on campus. Specifically around compliance, um, I think as we get closer and closer and have uh, students come back to campus, there have been lots of questions about what compliance will look like. And so I think this is an opportunity just to talk about uh, sort of three things um, specifically. Uh, again, the institution is requiring masks uh, on campus. Um, uh, so far, uh, I think we continue to see uh, greater and greater compliance on our campus. Um, I, I, I have said this uh, recently, I will give a lot of credit uh, to our visitor center. We have communicated this expectation to our visitors. Uh, it's a communication that we uh, have certainly shared in housing as we think about move in. And I know my colleague, uh, Dr. Tricia Clement Montgomery, will talk about this uh, in just a moment. Uh, but it's also an expectation that we have for all students, faculty, and staff. Um, and so that will be really important as we think about in the classroom, uh, an expectation that all people have masks. It, you know, as we think about student and academic support services and going into uh, an, an office uh, to have face to face services. You know, that is an expectation that, that everyone uh, who's in that space in an open space uh, is wearing a mask. And so uh, that is a, a, an expectation that I think we've been really clear on. Um, and, and, you know, from, from the evidence and, and from a public health uh, perspective, it will be really, really important for the safety of our students. 
Um, uh, we've been in the process of, of educating folks on campus. Uh, and, and again, going back to this idea of how do we make compliance easy, uh, again, we are uh, providing uh, all students, faculty, and staff with two masks. Uh, we will have additional PPE and single-use masks available outside of uh, academic classrooms and spaces. Um, and, and so again, uh, just trying to make it as easy as possible, knowing how important that is uh, for everyone's health and safety. Uh, again, I've, I've spent some time talking about the testing. We do have an expectation that all individuals get tested. Uh, again, as I referenced earlier, people can get tested before they come, you know, uh, within seven days of their arrival. Obviously, uh, if they don't and they, and they come to campus, really encouraging people to get tested within that first 24, 48 hours. Um, but one of the, the sort of caveats or nuance uh, to this, and again, this has been in partnership with ongoing research with the, the start team and Dean DePaula is, we will have some students who have already tested positive uh, for coronavirus, and uh, we will not be asking those individuals to get retested. Uh, I, I think the, the research and literature, uh, and literature has shown there's a high likelihood to have a false negative. Uh, and so again, we would just ask that you submit that earlier result to the institution through, your, uh, through the portal and the directions uh, that we've posted uh, on our FAQ around screening and testing. Um, but uh, again, we are, in terms of students who live in our residence halls, uh, will be on campus, will have face-to-face -face instruction. Um, doing that initial testing is really, really important for us uh, to, to understand uh, and, and, and to really help us as everyone returns uh, stop the spread of the virus. Um, uh, so between the initial testing, the mask, the only last piece, and, and again, I referenced this earlier, in terms of our screening, we're really going to be monitoring that and leveraging our, our technical capabilities uh, of requiring students to do that every day. Uh, again, we will have follow-up communications encouraging that behavior. Um, certainly, that will be encouraged by our, our student ambassadors and people on campus. Uh, you know, again, getting into the habit of, of monitoring your daily symptoms is, is really, really important. Um, and, and for those folks who don't, uh, again, we will have follow-up calls, just checking in with students uh, to make sure everything is okay. Uh, just understanding that, uh, you know, students' lives uh, become hectic and sometimes, you know, there might be uh, some legitimate or, or, or just innocent reasons why someone may not have done that. But uh, we will be monitoring uh, all of those pieces as we think about uh, coming back and having our restart and reinvented opening for the fall. Thank you. Dean Kerwald, before we move on, can I, uh, we have a couple of questions that I think might be pertinent to answer here. Um, one question from a parent is, are we planning uh, periodic testing throughout the semester for students? I, I actually think that's a better question for Dean DePaula. Great. So uh, one of the things that we're, we're doing now is we're, we're taking a look at the initial results uh, in terms of this baseline testing. And we have been meeting and even looking at some of the data that's out there uh, that talks about that. Um, you know, keep in mind that what we're doing as a, as a process is, is testing all students that are, that are here coming onto campus uh, and uh, doing it with, a, with a, a highly sensitive and highly specific uh, test along with contact tracing. Um, we, we're having discussions over um, what additional testing might be appropriate depending on the initial results that we see, and we're monitoring that as well. Great. Thank you so much. Trisha? Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, so good evening. I'm so excited to be with you all tonight. Um, my hope is to really try to walk you through some of the protocols, procedures, and programming that we have within the residence halls. Um, and how we intend to welcome students back to a safe and secure environment. So first, I'm going to start out by just talking to you a little bit about what we have put in place in terms of policies and procedures. Um, I can say that all of our full-time staff who are in the residence halls, and for those of you who may not know, we have a, an office assistant that will greet you at the door um, of every residence hall. And we also have a resident director who is in that building. All of our full-time staff have actually uh, been tested already. They were expected to be tested before they arrived um, to work. And then all of our student staff, which are our RAs, are in the process of being tested right now. So um, we have ensured that all of our staff have gone through the testing and screening process as well um, before greeting students or welcoming students into that residential environment. 
When you get into the residential um, space, you'll see that there's also plexiglass barriers at all of the front desks. Um, but again, that is to ensure the safety of um, not only our students, but our staff and to, and to prevent transmission there. Um, there's also going to be a lot of signs within the residence halls. And so those signs will talk to you a little bit about what capacity looks like in public spaces, how many people should be allowed in certain spaces, as well as maybe on the elevators, things like that within our residence halls. Um, and in addition to that, we also have signs in relation to um, how you should appropriately wear a mask and, and things like that while in the residence halls, particularly in public spaces within our residence halls. So in addition to all of the masks, as um, my colleague Dean Carwald had already mentioned, there'll be wellness packets inside of every room. So all of our resident advisors have placed wellness packets inside every student's room. So once they arrive, they will actually see that inside of their rooms. Um, and then in, the, in addition to the wellness kits, um, we also have schedules as well as um, um, protocols or recommendations on how students should prepare or expect to clean their spaces with inside of the residence hall. Um, so we have literally tried to think through every step possible to make sure that the, the space is as safe as possible for students to enter. Um, in addition to that, you may have heard that we have some policies and procedures that we have also implemented, one being our visitation policy. And so in the past, our visitation policy was basically we allowed two guests per student inside of the residence hall. That still remains. We will still be allowing two students per um, resident inside the residence hall. However, we ask that those guests are UK students as well. So that's the, the biggest difference is that now we're only asking for UK students and non-UK students would not be allowed to visit the residence halls. But again, that is to uh, make sure that we stop the spread and not allow for anything else outside of the community to come into those spaces. Um, in addition to all of those things, uh, you may have also heard about our move-in protocol, which will allow for um, you to make an appointment to move into our residential communities. We intentionally made sure that we only had one, um, a, every student come in at one hour appointments. And the reason why we did that is to ensure social distancing as well. And so that we don't have a group of parents or a group of students trying to come in all at one time. So this will also um, give you the space to be able to move into your residential space comfortably um, and not necessarily have a lot of people trying to move in at one time. We also asked and had promoted that all families bring in at least two pe people to help them move, and that was to assist with de um, decreasing density within those spaces. So uh, everything we could possibly think of, again, we have thought about in terms of policies and procedures. Now, that said, I want to talk a little bit about programming um, because we have a lot of programs that we have put in place to make sure that we're still engaging students and students feel, still feel a sense of community with inside of those spaces and that they also belong here at the university and inside of our residence halls. One of the things your student may have already received an invitation from our RAs who are actually having floor meetings and community meetings today. Um, so at six o'clock is when all our RAs facilitated a community virtual um, floor meeting with all of their residents. That is the first of many more to come. So our RAs are prepared to make sure that they have one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one meetings regularly with every student on their floor as well as facilitating community meetings so you can get to know the other students who are on your floor as well. There'll be a combination of different programming that will be done. We have a lot of virtual programming that will take place in the residence hall. We facilitate a program every year called After Office Hours in which we bring in faculty and staff. That's still going to happen, and that's a program that will happen virtually. But then we also have programs that will also happen outside of the residence halls. So there'll be programs such as um, yoga or, or contactless types of programs that students can actually be involved in with their RA and resident advisor to, make, again, build that sense of community and support amongst our students. 
Um, so we have truly tried our hardest to to make sure that we provide everything both inside and outside of the residence halls to promote that sense of community and belonging. Um, but again, uh, we welcome any questions or thoughts that you all may have in relation to that. So thank you. Thank you. Trey? Hi, good evening, everyone. It's nice to talk to you all. Um, my role here is primarily to work with faculty on uh, teaching, curriculum development, uh, course design, and so on. Um, and that's what our center does, the Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching. Um, we work on issues related to student engagements, to innovative designs, and other any questions related to how to improve the educational environment at UK. And over the summer, I've had the privilege of working on the ground with UK's faculty who have all been hard at work in preparation for teaching this fall. And just to kind of talk about how exceptional those faculty are for every job opening at a faculty position at an institution like UK, there are literally hundreds of applicants and you have to be an extraordinary researcher and show great promise as an educator to join our community. And I've seen that talent at work this summer with our faculty's deep investment in their development as teachers. Just as one example of how that's played out over the summer, my office along with others held a week-long symposium last week on uh, the development of innovative courses and engaging students for this fall semester. We had nearly 500 faculty participate with a total of 700 counting staff and other graduate instructors, all of whom were earnestly engaging in conversations about how to serve our students best and help them learn. Our new incoming faculty are hitting the ground running while faculty who've taught at UK for decades who are nationally and globally renowned in their fields have dived into learning about new technologies and teaching techniques with earnestness and energy. So to state the obvious, this has not been a normal summer. Um, our faculty have just put in a Herculean effort, and I've used that word quite a bit this summer to describe what's happened. And uh, they've reflected on what's happened in the spring, over the summer, they've rethought their courses, and all the while keeping in mind how students learn and succeed. We've had virtual office hours in my unit all summer long, and they've been full and busy. Our uh, instructional consultants have been booked all summer working one-on-one -on -one with faculty, working with departments or colleges on all manner of issues. So a large part of the work that our faculty have been doing has revolved around designing their courses around different delivery modes for this fall semester. And as we all know, no classroom can hold as many students as it once did. And so we've had to get creative about how to leverage the great asset that is our on-campus experience to support student learning. And so you might have noticed in the course catalog different modalities of course delivery. And so I'll go over just a few of these as to what students might expect uh, in the fall semester. Um, so for example, um, a lecture that might formerly have had hundreds of students in one room may now have a rotating cast of students with remote students engaging simultaneously with what we might call a simulcast delivery model. And we're leveraging our video technologies uh, such as Zoom or Echo 360. Uh, most of our classrooms on campus have been outfitted with some kind of video hardware installed in the room to broadcast and record classes for this purpose. And instructors have been thinking very creatively about how to involve students and engage them remotely to where remote does not have to mean distant from the learning experience, where students can interact with their peers who are both remote and in-person using different modes of communication and collaborating on different digital apps. We also have a different mode of class that you would have seen called hybrid uh, instruction. And this is a model that can also go by many names such as flipped or alternating attendance. And the spirit of this is that students learn best when they are doing, when they are applying their learning and engaging in hands-on activities. And this model will lend itself very well to a high-touch interactive experience uh, that's worthy of a UK education to where students will complete coursework on their own pace outside of class and in a rotating attendance model 
uh, complete hands-on activities, discussions, simulations with the faculty and their instructors in person. And I, I see a question that has come up uh, regarding about uh, how laboratory-based learning can happen you know, in this remote environment. And I think that's relevant to the point that I'm discussing right now um, in terms of how this high-touch learning can still happen uh, in very effective ways with alternating attendance models, especially in lab situations that demand the use of specialized equipment where learning cannot be separated from the doing and where students need to uh, manipulate different materials and be present in the room. In addition, we'll of course have classes that have many online components and this will leverage the technologies that we have available to us at UK, again, to make a remote experience not distant, but in fact engaging and very interactive. So consistently throughout all this preparation and across the different ways of conducting classes, the, the core value that I just observed has been student engagement and maintaining a connection between student and instructor. This has driven our faculty's preparation um, to support all of our students, whether they're in person or remote, whether we're talking about the use of educational technologies or creative approaches to teaching a subject matter or just the humane attention to all of the learner's needs. Uh, we know from the shift in the spring to remote instruction that students experience difficulty staying organized, motivated, feeling connected. They might have felt isolated. They might have felt unprepared to take on the challenges of learning along with the greater challenges of a pandemic. Our faculty have kept this in the forefront of their mind as they've been working on ways of connecting students, whether those students are physically in the classroom or learning from some other location. Uh, this may take the form of virtual office hours or group study sessions. This may involve connecting students with support services on campus that provide both in-person and virtual interfaces. This could involve peer work groups, team-based learning that can make a large lecture feel very small and personalized. Or this can involve students interacting using chat features, interactive platforms such as the Google Suite, and exerting an influence on an in-person class meeting, even if they might be sitting in their dorm room. So I'll leave my comments here just on a story of some initial research that was done uh, at the end of the spring semester uh, with some of our faculty in educational psychology and psychology on uh, how those students perceived the challenges of, their, um, of the, the turn to remote learning. And among some of the initial findings of that study, I think the thing that I found most striking is that students by and large very strongly perceived that their instructors cared about them, about their well-being, about whether or not they had what they needed, not just to continue in the class, but also to continue on in general. And this, I think, is our greatest asset at this moment among our scholars and educators who are already leading their fields and excelling and now helping us meet the challenge uh, to help our students learn this fall semester. Thank you so much. We are going to switch to a time of answering questions from our parents and families um, from Facebook and YouTube. So we have a lot of questions and, um, and we will get started um, with a couple of them. A couple of parents and families are Wondering about online learning, so Trey, you were just talking a little bit about that. I'm wondering if, if their student um, doesn't feel like they're going to be able to learn online or um, has trouble, um, what's the process for um, taking a leave of absence or um, potentially withdrawing from the university? I think my, we've, we've seen a lot of those questions about what to do if, if a student feels that they're having trouble with the mode of instruction, especially if there's a shift in the class. Um, our first advice, of course, is always to reach out to the instructor, the professor, and the TAs just to make sure that everyone stays in communication, um, as well as uh, reaching out to advisors uh, to talk about what a student's option are, options are at the time. Uh, my work is primarily with faculty, so uh, I'm not as intimately familiar with the process a student would go through in order to withdraw after 
Um, all the other avenues have been pursued, but what I do know is that we have a lot of people who'd be very dedicated to working with that student to help them strategize around how to um, succeed, about how to meet some challenges and connect them with the resources that they need, whether it's um, academic coaching or whether it's some other resource on campus that can help them adapt to the online learning environment. I can also add that if a um, student is thinking about withdrawing and they're a returning student to, to kind of underscore what Trey said and to meet with their academic advisor, we have a, a withdrawal process uh, depending on what time of within the semester that is. There's, there's a different um, parts of that process that they might have to, to go through, whether it's at the beginning of the semester, the middle, or towards the end. If it's an incoming student who's not a returning student, so if it's a first-time um, first-year student or a first-time transfer student, and the, and before school has started, they they've decided they don't want to come this this semester for online reasons. Um, we would encourage them to contact their the admissions office to to look through a deferment. Great, thank you. We have a number of um, questions coming in about um, living in the residence halls. So I will defer to um, uh, Tricia and um, Dr. Dr. <laughs> Dean Kerwald um, on these. But specifically, um, they're asking about the length of time that students are going to be living in residence halls and why um, and, and this parent in particular asks, why are they still paying so much uh, for, for residence halls if they're not going to be living there through December? <laughs> Tricia? Or anyone? <laughs> I, I can take um, part of that question. Um, we are actually opening the residence halls earlier, so uh, although they won't be paying for it, um, uh, uh, Although the, although the residence halls won't be open in December, they are open uh, several weeks earlier in August. And so thinking through how we just shifted the semester up um, a, a, a few weeks um, on the front end rather than the back end. Great. And then we have some questions about um, what it's going to be like in some of the residence halls um, for students who do uh, test positive for COVID, um, specifically about how they're going to access food and, um, and just their basic needs while they're staying in those halls. Yeah, so I can answer that one. Um, we have uh, worked out a number of things and then Dean Cole, you might wanna share some more details in terms of the contact tracers, but as far as um, dining and things of that nature are concerned, we have actually worked with our partners in dining to make sure that all meals are delivered. So there will be food that will be delivered to the students that are in quarantine or in isolation, which is our COVID positive uh, hall facilities. Um, and it will be breakfast, lunch, and dinner that will be dropped off at the front door of every student who is in isolation. And our staff will um, go through and make sure that we drop those off. The student will then receive um, an email or a message letting them know that the food has been delivered and they should be able to just literally step outside of their door and grab their food. I know that there's going to be some more details in relation to class modality and how they can continue that. So I'll let uh, Dean Crowell answer that part of the question. Yeah, and I, uh, I realize I didn't uh, describe when uh, in talking about the UK Health Corps, one, uh, one of the positions that we have, uh, we have what we're calling wellness connectors. Uh, and these wellness connectors really uh, mirror uh, what the Commonwealth has done uh, as we've looked at, at the approach uh, to addressing the coronavirus. Um, uh, understanding, uh, and they're specifically called wellness connectors because you still have uh, needing to address just a lot of the initial questions. Uh, you, you get a lot of fear and anxiety related to what it means, uh, you know, to be to, to test positive. Uh, but part of it as well, uh, in, in addition to the food, uh, is really just to be attendant to, to emerging needs. Uh, and so again, it, it really comes from a place of care. Uh, I mean, someone might need uh, something related to, to meals, uh, but as we think about you know, questions about how to continue in coursework, uh, helping students, you know, how they navigate uh, and communicate that with their instructors or faculty um, to just make, you know, perhaps uh, things that, you know, you, some people might not have, but, uh, you know, thinking about prescription medications and, and how to continue to have those while you're in isolation.
isolation or quarantine or, uh, you, you know, uh, what to do if you have an, uh, an emotional support animal and what does it look like for the care of that animal or uh, how to do laundry. And, and so really assisting a student with that, uh, these wellness connectors uh, will, will assist and, and uh, walk through that process, provide that support to students. Part of this, again, like I said, is why we think this is so important is it's also connecting with our additional resources on campus. And so connecting with our basic needs uh, coordinator, uh, thinking about, you know, if you have uh, just emergency needs, how we connect with our big blue pantry, uh, how we connect, you know, we have students who work. And so what does that mean from a financial perspective of having really emergent uh, financial concerns? Uh, and so how we uh, evaluate and address those. Um, again, with this notion of uh, we want to put students in the best possible uh, position to be successful. Um, and and uh, we don't want uh, a student's positive result uh, for COVID uh, to result in them having to uh, right drop out. And so really being attentive to that, thinking about how we uh, put students in a position to continue in the semester, uh, again, whether that's food, thinking about uh, you know medications, animals, laundry, all of those things and, and doing our very best to support that student. Great, thank you. Um, so we have had a number of questions um, throughout today and, and this evening about um, the um, wildcard IDs. Um, for those of you who maybe are having some trouble accessing um, the IDs. So we have asked around and we've heard that the Gatton Student Center wildcard wild ID office is going to be reopening and will be open this weekend from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and then they will have regular hours starting on Monday. So if you, if your student has not been able to upload their photo or they're concerned that they're not going to get their student ID, um, have them come on over to the Gatton Student Center um, when they move in and, and we can get them um, sorted out there. We'll also be getting you more information um, soon and, and we'll be sharing that through our Catch Out email newsletter as well. Okay. So um, another question about move-in. Um, Trisha, you might, you might know the answer to this one. Um, some families are asking, is it okay to tag team or switch out who's helping the students move in? So for example, if um, two people help move in and then they switch with someone else to help decorate the room. Absolutely, it's okay to do that. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we control the density or amount of people that come in. But if you wanna switch off, that's, that's absolutely okay. Great. Okay, let's see what other questions we might be having. We know that there are a lot of questions right now, so um, and we, we probably will not get to all of them this evening, so um, just wanna let you know that even if we don't get the, to them this evening, we'll be sure to respond to them um, in the comments um, and probably we'll have more information for you through CatChat as well later on next week. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. Um, let's see. About scholarships, this might be a good one. Um, students, um, if they have a scholarship, um, would they be able to defer um, their scholarship if they um, decide that they would like to withdraw um, for the semester? I can answer that. Great. Um, if a student wishes to request a deferral, they should submit a, a request form to our Office of uh, um, Student Financial Aid and, and Enrollment Management, and they're reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis because each scholarship has different parameters, but I would highly encourage them to do that um, and, and they'll be reviewed. Great. All right, we have a couple of questions about um, the um, application, the app that we're gonna be using to um, do our daily check-ins. Um, and one question is specifically about um, students who maybe are having problems with allergies or asthma um, and, and those symptoms might be might look very similar um, to COVID symptoms. Um, is there gonna be a way for us to distinguish those from COVID symptoms on the mobile app? I could probably answer that. Um, you, know, the, uh, you know, just as you're, as you're hearing, you know, students will be required um, every day, uh, essentially to check in with a, with a mobile application or mobile app uh, and answer a series of questions. Um, the questions are really based on uh, evidence, and even as it's emerging, sometimes the questions are adjusted um, based on the CDC recommendations. Um, and the questions really help get at whether or not some of the symptoms are related to allergy. 
Um, but it's, it's always possible that they could have symptoms uh, where they answer yes, uh, and they're related to something other than COVID-19. And, and that's because uh, that app will then trigger uh, a contact so that it can be sorted out if the student, uh, in fact, has symptoms uh, of COVID-19 or uh, likely something else, just so that, uh, that their health is, uh, is taken care of uh, appropriately. So, so the app itself uh, does uh, try to specify uh, where possible uh, some of the symptoms that might be related to something other than uh, COVID-19, such as allergies. Um, but keep in mind that the, you know, some of the questions evolve over time, uh, and we keep updating those uh, as appropriate uh, based on based on the evidence. But we'll pay attention to that to be sure that uh, students are uh, taken care of with regard to their health, uh, even if they have uh, other conditions such as allergies that might be creating those symptoms. And um, along those lines, if a student develops symptoms later in the semester, where will they go for testing? I, um, I could answer that as well. Um, uh, University Health Services still uh, will be uh, operating as, as it always has and, and does. Um, so students will be able to get uh, care uh, and testing appropriately uh, at, uh, at UHS uh, as usual. Obviously, they also have the opportunity of their, you know, their own providers uh, as well. Thank you. Dean Kerwell, can you um, revisit um, compliance with mask wearing and how off-campus off parties are going to be handled? Well, I can address that in sort of two different ways. Um, I, I mean, as, as we've seen uh, within the Commonwealth um, in, in terms of the, the, the requirement to have masks or face coverings, uh, certainly at establishment and in, in businesses, um, I, I mean, I think it would be uh, pretty easy to say it, it becomes uh, more challenging uh, to do that. But in terms of, uh, I, I think, uh, sort of the larger question around just addressing off-campus behavior, uh, our, our code of student conduct and our expectations for students extend off-campus. Uh, and so just because they leave the, the physical parameters uh, of the University of Kentucky does not mean uh, that our expectations have changed related to their uh, health behaviors. Um, uh, we are certainly cognizant uh, of the kinds of things that have been in the news uh, around having parties and, and large parties and in, and in some ways uh, you might say intentional COVID parties. Uh, certainly we will uh, take those very, very seriously. So uh, uh, intentional violations uh, in, in having those kinds of events uh, and, and engaging in that kind of behavior, uh, we would deem very, very serious in, in terms of its implications from uh, certainly a public health perspective for our institution, uh, but also for the greater Lexington community. Um, and so uh, we have certainly partnered uh, with Lexington in thinking about, uh, we have a public report form uh, with which to report that through our Office of Student Conduct. Um, and that is something that we would address uh, again with uh, uh, based on a whole host of factors, but uh, would certainly take very, very seriously. Great. And Tricia, um, you spoke a little bit um, ago about the visitation policy. Um, could you clarify if students are going to be allowed to visit other students in their residence halls? Yes. Um, and I actually wanted to go back to another question that you had mentioned about the Wildcat IDs. If you were able to upload your picture um, through the website, your Wildcat ID will actually be in your residence hall for you if you live in the, in the residential facility. So you'll be able to pick them up there um, once you arrive, if you were able to get through that process. That um, ID card is going to allow for students to be able to visit other students in their residence halls. So if you want to visit a, a student, maybe you're a resident of um, Jewel Hall, you want to visit a student in Woodland Glen 3, you will be able to do that with your Wildcat ID. So yes, you will be allowed to, to visit other students in different residence halls. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, well at this time I want to thank all of our panelists for giving their time uh, this evening and really just for working so hard to prepare the whole community um, to return to campus safely. I'm really excited that we're all coming back. Um, so a couple of things before we, um, before we go. Just a reminder that if we did not get to your question tonight, we will um, be sure to, make, to get you an answer, um, either through Facebook, YouTube, or through the CatChat um, email newsletter. 
This recording will be available on the Cat Chat Live website um, as well as YouTube um, so that you can review it at your convenience. If you have additional questions, uh, feel free to contact the Parent and Family Association um, and we will um, post that email address um, in our um, comments so that you can have it and we are happy to um, help you get any answers that you are still looking for. Um, we hope that you will join us tomorrow night for our last two Cat Chat Live presentations um, of the summer. Um, the first will be at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and we'll be talking to um, our folks with K-Week. So if you want to know more about what's going to happen at K-Week, that's going to be a great one for you to participate in. And then at 6 p.m., um, our partners at University Health Service are going to be um, speaking a little bit about um, the, the programs and opportunities for students um, through student health. So that's a great one to be a part of as well. Students are also invited uh, to join the UK Student Government Association for a restart virtual info session on Monday, August 10th at 7 p.m. And they're gonna be discussing the fall semester with student leaders and um, UK administrators as well. Students can submit questions on BB Involved um, by Thursday, August 6th at 11 p.m. And then a Zoom link will be posted um, for that meeting on Monday evening so that students can participate. So if your student still has questions and they want to talk to other students and UK administrators, that's going to be a great place for them to go. I want to thank all of our families um, who were able to join us this evening. We know that you're putting a lot of trust in us this um, fall, and we really want to do everything that we can uh, to make sure this is a safe environment for your student um, and, that, and that we provide um, all that they need to really succeed here at UK. So travel safe um, as you're coming to campus, um, and we look forward to seeing you. Go Cats!